I'm very bullish. I expect corporate earnings to go up. I think interest rates are probably going to come down and most companies are carrying debt and they, their cost of carrying debt is going to go down. That will drop to the bottom line and we still have low unemployment. Any money you don't need for the short run, I'm a believer in stocks, 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 or other equity-like investments where you're an owner of things like private equity, real estate, and so on. New York Times best-selling author and award-winning investment advisor, Peter Malouk, CEO and president of Creative Planning, which is one of the largest registered investment advisors with $245 billion in client assets, and also author of the newest book, Money Simplified. It is great to welcome you on the show, Peter. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Julia. Well, I'm excited to have you on, Peter, and I've, I've heard about you for many, many years, so it's great to finally get to connect with you. And Peter, I'll let you know where I always start with my guest, and that is to get their big picture macro view of the economy and where we stand today. And one of the things about this show, Peter, is you can take all the time you need to give an answer. You will not be interrupted on this program. Well, I appreciate that. I, I tend to keep this answer pretty succinct, though. I think we when it, Think about the macro view, I think the short run and the long run. In the long run, it's very hard to be anything but incredibly optimistic. We have very low unemployment. You almost never see a severe recession. You never see a depression when you have very low unemployment. And that's structural. In the United States, we're going to have low unemployment for a long time because of the retiring boomers, issues with uh, legal immigration being slowed, people that retired early from COVID. We're going to have unemployment for a while, low unemployment for a while, which means we're going to have a lot of people uh, that are going to be able to work whenever they want, and there's going to be competition in the form of wages. But the bigger issues are we have a, over a billion people emerging from poverty worldwide. Those people are going to want to buy iPhones and Nike shoes and go to McDonald's and go to Walmart. People emerging from poverty in the middle class is incredibly positive for the economy. Demographic trends is one of the biggest factors when it comes to markets. And the other biggest factor is technological innovation. And I think if you look at this period in history, even thousands of years from now, if humans are fortunate enough to still exist in this crazy world, thousands of years from now, they will be studying this period of history in terms of technological innovation, the breakthroughs we're going to have with artificial intelligence, healthcare, and so on. And so if you look at the combination of the demographic trends, what's going on with technology and innovation, uh, and then far behind that, you look at low unemployment, it's very hard to over five or 10 years not expect the economy to expand and, and do well. Over the short run, everything is unpredictable. Wars are unpredictable. Is there going to be a cyber attack? Is there going to be another pandemic? Is it going to be something nobody is thinking about, which was really the last few severe crises were all things no one was thinking about. Barring the black swan event, things look great. The issue is there's a black swan event. Uh, even though they're called black swan events, it's supposed to happen almost never something like that seems to happen every five to 10 years. And how do you kind of um, convey that message to clients, like that optimistic view for that long run? But at the same time, you do have to navigate and I guess um, remain unshakable in this instance for some of those short run, um, you know, black swan like risk out there. I think that to me, managing the short run is not really about having to be overly aware about what's going on with elections or wars or anything like that and really s surrendering to the fact that this short run is uncontrollable that over five years nobody nobody knows what's going to happen right and so if you accept that nobody let, let's assume i have every single piece of information about the markets every single piece of information about wars and terrorism and everything else but then a cyber attack happens that's very severe well i mean it's game over right so we can't be at the mercy of the short run. And so the way that we talk to clients about it is let's not try to figure out what's going to happen in the next three months or three years because we can't. Anyone that tells you they can is lying to you. Instead, let's have our asset allocation protect us. Let's not have things that we need, we may need access to for the next five years. Let's not have those in asset classes that would be severely down if there's a crisis. And examples of things that would be severely down in a crisis would be things like alternative invest, many alternative investments and stocks. So over the very short run, we need to protect the portfolio with access to being able to convert to cash quickly without prices being severely depressed. A lot of different types of bonds fit that category. Mm, yeah, bonds for that category. Well, speaking of markets, um, now that we're um, into 2024, I a lot of folks got 2023 wrong. Um, 
I, I don't want to necessarily revisit the past, but how are you kind of thinking about markets this year and the year ahead? Well, if if everything was equal, and I don't I don't think it is, I'm very bullish. I mean, for all the reasons that we just talked about, I expect corporation corporate earnings to go up. I think interest rates are probably going to come down, and most companies are carrying debt, and the, their cost of carrying debt is going to go down. That will drop to the bottom line, and we still have low unemployment. But I don't. I, I feel like in the short run, we really can't make an investment decision based on on that thesis because there are so many wild card events that can happen. That's why the investor should go back to really making sure their allocation is not at the mercy of that. And now, if you don't need any money you don't need for the short run, I'm a believer in stocks, 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 or other equity-like investments where you're an owner of things like private equity, real estate, and so on. Hey there, I hope that you are enjoying this interview. If you can, please take a moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell. This will keep you up to date with all of our new interviews, and it will also help us grow this channel and continue to bring some amazing guests. Thank you so much for your support and enjoy the rest of the interview. How about like within the universe of stocks, growth, value, um, small caps, what are their particular areas? within that space that you like right now or favor? You know, it's been fascinating because all the research tells us that over the long run, small stocks do better than large stocks, just like stocks do better than bonds and it makes intuitive sense. No one would own a stock instead of a bond unless they expected a higher return because the stocks go up and down 50, 60%, it's just normal. But we do it because we expect the return to be higher. And it's the same thesis for why small stocks should do better than large stocks over the long run. They're a little riskier and why would you go buy a a smaller company when you can buy McDonald's or Apple, which is not going to surprise you by going bankrupt next year, right? Uh, you would only do it if you expected a higher return. And historically, the data bears that out, that small stocks will do better than large stocks. But if you look at the last 15 years, that's not been the case. Investors that have been more conservative and own the larger mega companies have actually done better than those that own the small companies. There's very few things that Vanguard, BlackRock, Goldman Sachs agree on and at the turn of this decade. All of them in their reports that I was reading were saying, hey, we're very bullish that small will do better than large stocks. And not only that, but that foreign stocks would again do better than U.S. stocks. That hasn't been the case so far this decade. I am a believer that that turn will come only because that turn always comes. Whether it's going to be this year or not, I don't know. But when it happens, it happens very quickly. We saw in the last few months uh, of last year, small cap stocks went up 30% in just a matter of weeks, You know, recovering from years uh, of lagging in a very short period of time. I think we're going to see that again with international uh, here in the coming years. Any particular markets when it comes to international? So we at Creative Planning, we use basically Europe, Asia as a piece of it. We like emerging markets, excluding China as well. Um, the Chinese markets, I think, have all kinds of problems. The Chinese government's trying to prop it up very unsuccessfully. And in the long run, it gets even worse because they've got all the, they got the reverse problem and that they have uh, demographic issues where you're going to see their population de decline by hundreds of millions in the coming decades. I think they've got a lot of problems they're not going to be able to solve in that economy. Yeah, yeah, got that. And then kind of going back to the macro, I heard you talk about, um, you know, you expect rate cuts this year. We have the FOMC coming up. How are you thinking about the Federal Reserve this year? Well, I think like really watching them has been fascinating. If you look at the the COVID crisis, they basically reacted to it in a, in a textbook fashion without really taking into account context. They basically said, oh, 08, 09, uh, tech bubble, 9, 11, and all these cases, people cocoon, they didn't go buy things. And we lowered rates until we, we got Americans to go buy things. And it worked. And so with COVID, they said, oh, well, no one's working. People aren't buying things. Let's lower rates. Well, they really didn't need to do that. We had low unemployment. People wanted to buy things. They just thought they were going to die. So they were trapped inside and not, not willing to go on vacations and buy cars and houses. There was a lot of uncertainty. But it was really as if there was a blizzard. There's a blizzard. I don't know that we need to lower rate cuts hundreds of basis points. Just when the blizzard's over and things get shoveled, people will go spend money. So they came outside with a spending vengeance and they had all this money in their pockets and they had lowered rates too much and all this money and wanting to spend and low rates, free money. We had very, very high rapid uh, inflation. And I think there was a lot of question if they could get a soft landing, if they could lower rates, get inflation under control without sending us into a recession and a lot of skeptics. And it looks like they've done a pretty good job of it. And I think that the indication that they're going to lower rates this year, which they said, They'd probably do several times. We expect it to be in the summer and the end of the year. 
tells me that they think that if they don't do that, we would tip into a recession. So I, I am pretty bullish on the Fed following through on lowering rates. I think they've got a lot of reasons to do it. They're not political, supposedly, but it is an election year. And I, and I, I also think that we've got a very high cost of carrying this national debt and very high interest rates that makes that much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So do you think, are you in the soft landing camp? That's like a debate that's come up often on the show. Some folks are still in the hard landing. Are you, would it be safe to say I think soft landing? I think it's not a crash landing, which I consider an overwhelming success. You know, when you have the quickest rate hike, the quickest rate drop, and you somehow navigated okay, I mean, that's was pretty impressive, or a lot of luck, or they're the beneficiaries of extremely low unemployment, uh, and um, and are maybe getting too much credit. I think it's going to be bumpy. It's obviously not going to be perfect, but it's been better than I think most have expected. Let me ask you this too, because this this is another topic that comes up on the show is um, the the debt situation here in the U.S. And we crossed thirty four trillion at the beginning of the year. Do you have a take on our debt situation? Yeah, I think that the concerns around the debt are, are not. It's not hyperbole. I think this is a very big problem. If you look, look at the number one risk to the United States, it's our national debt. It's not war. It's not any of these. It's the national debt. And I think I think. The issue with national debt is that the, the people that control it face no will face none of the consequences, right? So whether it's Republicans that they have their own things they want to spend on or Democrats that have their own things they want to spend on, what they both share in common is on their watch, the national debt goes up. It's gone up under Biden. It's gone up under Trump. And there are these theories that it's not like a household, and it's not true. I mean, it, it is like a household. Eventually, those debts have to be paid. So we really are burdening future generations. And the only thing that allows the expanding debt to work is if we can make those make those payments and that everyone else believes we can make the payments without debasing the currency. So what's happening now is because interest rates are higher and the debt is bigger, the percentage of US tax dollars that is having to go to just pay interest on the debt is soon going to be higher than we spend on the military and social security and Medicare and everything else. That means all those debt payments can't go to all of these other programs. And there's only two ways out of that. One is you have massive growth and higher taxes and you're taking the higher taxes and the growth and you're paying it down. And the second is the Federal Reserve, the government creates inflation to make the to make the debt easier to manage, which means it's basically like Greenspan said, the hidden tax. They basically confiscate money from Americans by basically making their dollars be worth less. And I think that all of those are negative. And I think the issue is that no one no one in office today there is any negative consequence of the spend. It's also one of those situations where everything is okay until it isn't. It doesn't just gradually get worse. It's one of those things that oh what's going on what's going on what's going on crisis. The, the last thing I'll say on this is one advantage we have is we can get away with it over the short run because there's not another strong global currency, right? So China has its own issues, as you and I were just discussing. If we look at the euro, I, if you know, or a betting person, I would think the euro is not going to exist in 50 years, right? You know, I don't know that people are going to hang their hat on that. So you see attempts to get away from U.S. currency because the way we use currency is a weapon in regional wars but there's really not a true alternative. And that's giving us more runway than we would have otherwise. Yeah, it's something I think about. It's come up often on this um, show and if we'll make some of those decisions sooner than later. Um, I want to pivot to another topic just because you running, uh, you're running 245 billion. Um, and that's a huge number to think about and a lot of clients and I just more recently we had um, the Bitcoin spot ETFs. Do, do clients ask you about Bitcoin? Is that something that you all do, or just? I mean, do you have a take on Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies more generally? We get asked about cryptocurrencies all the time. My my opinion on cryptocurrencies is that ninety nine point nine percent of them are going to go to zero, and already that's pretty much happened, right? But I think that whatever is still left today, ninety nine point nine percent will still go to zero. There will probably one, be one or two that emerge. Maybe it will be Bitcoin. Maybe it won't. Right now, I just view it as speculating. There's a lot of people that do ask about Bitcoin. And, and at Creative Planning, if somebody asks about they want any investment in their portfolio, they we, they can put it in their portfolio. So everything's tailored to whatever the client wants. We basically build a plan with them and say, 
okay, based on your plan, here's how we cover the short run, the intermediate run, the long run, here are the best investments. We go negotiate the best pricing possible for them. We take a tax sensitive approach, but if they say, I want to have, uh, I want to be 5% in China, we will, we will do that for them, even though we wouldn't recommend it. And if they ask to own any cryptocurrency, you know, we will, we will help them, even though we won't make the, make the recommendation. So I view it as if you're buying Bitcoin, you're just buying a bet that crypto, uh, this, that will be the cryptocurrency or one of the two or three that will prevail. And it might be, but it's a bet. That's how, that's how I perceive mm. it. A bet, yeah. Another topic that's popular on this show or comes up um, is gold and the role of gold in a portfolio. What is what's your viewpoint on gold? You know, I'm not a fan of gold. I mean, if you look at an ounce of gold today, it it, it will buy a, a person a nice suit. It would have done the same 100 years ago and basically bought about the same several thousand years ago. It's basically to me, if we were just talking about cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency replacing money. Gold is money. I just view gold is money. So if you look at all the empires that have risen and fallen, gold was in the background as a currency. It could always be used as a currency through centuries after centuries after centuries from before Jesus through today. Uh, we've seen all these empires rise and fall and gold has been money and gold has basically kept up with inflation. It's done worse than bonds over the long run, much worse than stocks, much, much worse than real estate and other asset classes. So I don't like buying it as an investment to grow wealth. It doesn't produce any income. It's taxed at a higher rate. Um, it can have a high carrying cost in some circumstances, and it's going to probably underperform all the other asset classes with more volatility. So I don't like it as an asset class. But if you were asking me, hey, I had to have a pile of assets and I'm going to go on a time machine and wake up a thousand years from now and I can only take one thing with me, I'm not going to take the US dollar. I'm not going to take a cryptocurrency. I'm going to take gold. I'm going to go to Costco and load up on my gold. Okay, so um, okay, so I heard earlier um, stocks, um, international. Also heard bonds, um, real estate. Can you kind of give me a walk through? Like, what what are the what are you all favoring right now? What do you all like? Um, just curious. You know, there. If, if someone comes to us after we've covered their short term money, we're we're very big believers in in having a, a equity oriented portfolio that's global in nature and is tilts large cap, even though we expect small cap to do better over the long run because large cap's a little less volatile. And we are a believer in private investments. So we like in many cases using private, in particular private equity and private lending, where we do expect that, you know, with the right managers, that's very different than the public markets. We believe you can outperform over the very long run. And so we really favor how do we get as much of the portfolio in those types of asset classes as possible really for us bonds is about meeting shorter term needs and that's it it can be an example for private equity like maybe one that you all have done in the past i think if i look at private equity and private lending th those asset classes i like you know the big big names that have been doing this for a very long time and have a tremendous amount of resources so think of places like bain capital and goldman sachs and apollo and, and names like that Mm -hmm. I'm really not interested in finding like the, the hot new thing where someone's only been doing this for seven years. You really want to be where the big money is and the and the proven talent is. That doesn't mean that anyone can't succeed in this space, but I'd much rather see I'd much rather see someone who's won over and over again in that particular space. I view it very different than the public markets, where we're much more focused on keeping costs down and getting broad diversified exposure. Got it. Well, you know, you've written many books over the years, um, a lot of them addressing um, mistakes or pitfalls or biases that investors have. And maybe for the folks who are watching and listening, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see investors make? So that was actually my first book, The Five Mistakes Every Investor Makes and How to Avoid Them. And I think that the biggest one I see is people market time. And there's people that like market time, like go in and out of the market all the time and almost universally pay negative consequences for that. Even the professionals that do it as a group dramatically underperform. But I think a lot of people do it and don't think they're doing it. They get a bonus, but they wait for an election to pass or Ukraine to resolve itself or whatever. Uh, or they get a tax refund and they wait or they get an inheritance and they wait or they retire and they move their 401k to cash and then decide what to do with it. All of those things are market timing. And the data is overwhelming that as you get capital, you should deploy it. And if you make that repeated behavior over your entire life, the odds you're going to come out ahead are pretty dramatic. 
I think the other is overactive security selection. You're tr- t- tactically moving from equity to equity over and over again. We know with mutual funds and hedge funds, where supposedly these are the best investors, they dramatically underperform. Or the longer they do it, the more they underperform by actively trading. The, an equity investor should be really focused on what asset classes should I be in? Let me diversify. Let me control my costs. Let me control my taxes. You're going to do better than 90% of the traders. How about the role that like investor psychology plays in this? I imagine there's like a lot of human nature that comes into play when it when when investing where you can, you know, make some of these mistakes. Why well, yeah, I think it's a good point. I think human human nature trumps everything. I guess I think if you have and really market timing securities, these are all really derivatives of the human nature issues um, of maybe being overconfident or, or or being fearful or greedy. I think that people that do the best over the long run are people that have a good temperament, are not easily spooked, and really understand they're educated about how markets play out over time. And there's a lot of studies around this. Kind of a very basic one is that people that look at their 401k accounts less tend to own more stocks than people who look at it all the time. And the reason is probably that people that look at their accounts less, they're not freaking out every time there's a correction. Uh, they're busy seeing patients or whatever it is that they're doing. If they're a doctor or or if they're in they've got a job that keeps them really busy or family that keeps them really busy, they don't get worked up in the in the month to month or day to day narratives of the financial media. And because of that, they leave their portfolios alone and they stay invested more in volatile assets, which reward them over time. It's kind of a dispassionate investor focused on the long run, not overly involved, is usually going to outperform the others. Mm -hmm. I think even you've shared data in the past, like um, going back to like market timing, not worrying about that, that even if you got in like the worst possible time or like like the day before the crash, like over the long run, you could still do well. Yeah, I think if, if someone just goes and Googles the, you know, the Dow over 100 years and you really look back at, at even say crises, like if you invested at the worst time in 2008, well, you're up hundreds of percent from then to now. If you invested it, I mean, the day before the crash in 08 or 09, if you invested the day before 9 11, if you invested the day before the tech bubble, in all of these cases, it, in that period of time, it feels awfully stupid. But if we look at it in the rearview mirror, it really doesn't matter that much, right? The key is to be investing uh, and not really try to be figuring out, is today the absolute perfect time? You're more likely to be punished for being on the sideline than for being super unlucky and top ticking the market. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you just more of like um, biographical stuff about you, because um, ahead of this interview, I learned that you were an employee of creative planning um, and eventually you bought the firm. Like, Peter, what is your story and how did you come about um, buying the firm um, and also growing it to the level it is today? Because I know it definitely was not that size now. It's $245 billion. Um, just, I would love to hear your own story and, and journey there. So basically in the early 2000s, I was an advisor to other advisors. So I'd go to all different types of firms, brokerage houses, insurance companies, independent firms, and I would give tax advice or legal advice to their clients, sometimes do planning for their clients. And I really learned from a lot of incredible advisors and I learned from some, you know, what not to do, but I saw that clients wanted things to be customized for them. They wanted to have a plan that was, you know, continuous, not one time. So people really knew what was going on with them. And they really wanted legal tax, investments, planning, all of that in one place. That's kind of what my job was, was plugging in pieces of it. And at Creative, um, up until 2004, they were one of my clients. I was actually on the payroll. I was there two days a week taking care of their clients. They had a a few dozen clients at the time, managed about 30 uh, or 35 million or so. And in 2004, I wanted to have a firm that put it all together. And the owner of Creative uh, was ready to uh, retire. And then I took that over and started hiring from there and put putting all these things in one place, taking the firm completely independent, starting to include planning and customizing things and implementing our investment philosophy. And we just hit our you know, 20th year here uh, since I since I started doing that as an owner uh, on January 1st. So it's been a fun ride. What, 20 years? Oh, so it was 2004 when you um, bought the firm. That's right. Got it. Oh, well, great run. Um, well, Peter, it's been great having you on the show. I want to give you a few moments. Uh, let folks know where they can find you on social, pick up your book or books, if you will, um, and learn more about creative planning. Also, any parting thoughts, anything that we didn't bring up in this conversation 
um, that you'd like to leave with the audience to think about? So in terms of how to follow me, I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. You can also follow Creative Planning or go to our website if you want to learn more, creativeplanning.com. The new book is Money Simplified, which you can, I think, buy just about anywhere. But I know that Amazon seems to be the preferred choice for a lot of people. We cover a lot, some of the things we talked about on this call. I, what I would leave, if, if there's only one thing I could leave, I, I, it's what I tell everybody at the end, end of every talk after Q&A is all of the Q&A tends to be about current events, but an investor should be really focused on the long run. And I would end where, with the first question you asked me about how I see the macro environment. Over the long run, it's very hard to be anything but optimistic. Don't let anybody interfere with the real view of the long run, which is that we've got many, many people coming out of poverty. We're living in a time of mind-blowing innovation. Um, and when you look at those things, they tend to be things that are really good for the economy over the long run. And if you're a long-run investor, don't get caught up in the in the day-to-day narrative, the elections, the wars, the news. Stay focused and things are going to work out for you. I love that message of uh, long run optimism. Well, Peter Malouk, CEO and president of Creative Planning and author of the new book, new book, Money Simplified. Great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, your ideas, all of your knowledge. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for having me, Julia.